The first thing that Brady saw when he awoke was Kaylee gazing down on him with an ominous look of concern. As her face slowly came into focus, he could see Joe behind her, and he heard him saying, Check his eyes. Here, use this, as he passed her a small pen light from the myriad of pens and pencils in his pocket protector. She shone it directly into each of his eyes, waiting for them to dilate. Normal, she said. Can he move? asked Joe. I don't know, said Kaylee, as she put her hand on his cheek and asked him gently, Brady, can you hear me? Brady smiled and said, You have the most beautiful eyes, Athena. His mind was swimming, but he couldn't help but think how positively radiant she seemed. It was as though her whole face was surrounded by a glowing halo. She looked up at Joe and said, He may have brain damage. They heard Brady begin to laugh. I'm okay, he said. I just had the wind knocked out of me, that's all. Boy, you have some explaining to do, Joe said. Come on, she said. Can you get up? He arose from the floor with her help, and she led him to the chair. Brady, it's hard for us to understand what happened here. I know. I guess it's time to set the record straight. I'm not afraid anymore, anyway. What do you mean? asked Joe. I mean, I can tell you what I know without caring if you believe me, because if we're going to survive, you've got to believe me. The world has changed, and we've all changed with it. I seem to have experienced the most change, but Kaylee's different now, too. I'm not sure about you, Joe, but I bet even you have experienced the world a little differently since everybody else died. Both Kaylee and Joe remained silent to this assertion. She was open to almost anything. Now that she had heard the sky screaming and had heard a disembodied voice speak with enough force to hurl Brady across the room. Brady, is Grindle the same Dr. Grindle I've been speaking to you about? asked Kaylee. Yes and no. He's in there, this Dr. Grindle, but there's more to Grendel, the monster, than the doctor. It's like Dr. Grindle is possessed by some kind of spirit. I don't know where the monster Grendel came from, but he seems to know me. He keeps calling Dr. Grindle Grendel, like the monster in the Beowulf story. Only he's just a man. I mean, I should know. I spent a lot of time with him, she said. That's because you don't see him as he really is. Not yet, anyway, because I do. I don't know why I can see him and you can't, but I swear to you, the thing that I fought was more than a man, way more. Possessed? asked Joe. Like demonic possession? I mean, are you saying Dr. Grindle, the head of the CDC's response unit, and the originator of the plague, is actually possessed by a... a demon? No, I, I didn't say he was possessed by a demon, Brady countered. I said it was like he was possessed. But he isn't a demon, not like from hell. This thing that has power over him is using him mostly as a vehicle, riding around on top of him, using his mouth, his eyes, and his hands and feet. A parasite? asked Kaylee. Are you saying he's being controlled by a parasitic being? Sort of. It's hard to put into words. Would it make any more sense if I said that to you that he looks like a man, but to me, when I look at him, I, I see a huge monstrous body with a face that keeps changing shape? Oh, yeah, that would make a lot more sense, she replied sarcastically. Well, it's true. I see things differently than I used to, and I don't know why. But it's like I'm more in tune with the world than I ever was before the abandonment. I can sense things sometimes before they happen. I interact with things that are impossible to interact with. I thought I was going crazy, but after tonight, there's no going back. I mean, this is who I am. This is me. I'm his enemy. Joe took a chair and brought it close to Brady so that they were sitting knee to knee. Intent upon discovering the solution to this mystery, he said, Give me some specifics. Uh, what do you interact with? I talk to statues and books, and they talk back. It's true, muttered Kaylee. I can understand Hugin when I ask him yes or no questions, and he understands everything I say. 
That doesn't make sense, said Joe, wanting to believe but needing more proof. Um, Joe, I don't know how to say this, but I saw him talk a 500-pound moose off the highway. He walked right up to it and just had a conversation. I didn't understand what I was looking at, but now, well, I just don't know. I've also personally seen a stone gargoyle and a bronze statue come to life and talk to me. Brady continued. I have a personal relationship with the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin and the statue of General Joshua Chamberlain in Freedom Park in Brewer. I've watched the spirits of the dead walking through Mount Hope Cemetery, and I've been haunted by voices that tell me things. One of the voices was Susan, a girl I knew in school. She told me where you were, Kaylee, and that's, that's where I had to help you escape from, and I listened to her, and that's how I found you. Is the boy schizophrenic? asked Joe quietly in disbelief. Well, what do you think, Joe? Kaylee responded. They sat in a heavy silence fraught with worry as both Kaylee and Joe weighed his seemingly disturbing revelations in silence. No, said Joe slowly in a nearly inaudible voice. I think he's all right. We all heard the sky screaming. We both saw him control the electrical current. Let me tell you, as a master electrician, that's just impossible. Kaylee added, he has a point. The world feels different to me, and it's more than just a big empty space left by all the people. Maybe it has changed because of the big empty space left by all the people. Brady continued, oh, and the dogs that we've seen, they're not really dogs. I mean, they used to be before the abandonment, but since then... They've been slowly changing into creatures more and more like the humans who used to be their masters. I think they're under Grendel's influence. It's like he's their alpha dog or something. Anyway, Kaylee and I together were strong enough to beat him the first time. You should have let me kill him when I had the chance, muttered Kaylee. Don't you see, Brady said, leaning forward. If you had, you would have killed Dr. Grendel too. I mean, he's not the problem. He's not the monster. The monster is the exoskeleton controlling the body. When you first told me about Dr. Grindle, Kaylee, I thought you were crazy. How could you not see this monster, this grotesque beast that was attacking me? And then I thought about it, and I knew you were different from me, and the world changing had affected you differently. Maybe every survivor of the abandonment is affected personally, in his or her own way. How so? asked Joe. Well, when we went to the water tower, she said, suddenly remembering. Yes, that was when you had this weird idea that the water was talking to you. You liked the sound of the water. It moved towards you. You were that way then. And now I'd bet whenever you go near water, like a river or a stream, a lake or a pond, it's going to affect you the same way. Maybe you're sensitive to water now. Maybe you can use it like a tool. She looked off into a corner of the room and said nothing, pondering his words. Joe spoke next. Grendel instead of Dr. Grindel. Hmm. Monster instead of man. There's another thing, the aurora. That was impossible, unless the sun just experienced a flare so big it would have enveloped the earth. And since we're still here and not fried to a crisp, I'll take your words at face value. Thanks, Brady replied. Just one thing. I'm, what is Grendel? Who is he and what's his nature? That's what we've got to discover said Joe. Well, I'm not sure where he comes from or who he is. Sometimes I think we've even met him before, like like somehow we're familiar. He's a lot stronger than the last time I wrestled with him. Something has made him a lot stronger than when we first fought with him. I mean, come on, he was able to control the Northern Lights. They sat in conversation for long moments until Brady reminded them, you know, we still haven't made contact with Radio Ukraine. We failed. He knew we were trying to contact them, and he stopped us. Well, he must be mastering some immense power to block our transmission by generating some sort of electrical or magnetic field, said Joe. I wonder how he knew. What does it matter? What we need to do now is try again, answered Brady. Not with his equipment, said Joe, rising slowly to painful knees. He walked over to the radio bench and picked up the flashlight he always kept clipped beneath. After examining the equipment, he concluded, Busted. 
Yes, fried, magnetized. This is an ex-transmitter. It's just a pile of junk. She hadn't said anything for a few moments, but now she stood up firmly and said, Then we start over. We try again with a bigger antenna, with a more powerful transmitter. We have time. We could do this. We're smarter than he is, even if he is strong. Joe nodded and agreed. We don't have a choice, but that poses a problem. How are we going to stop him from interfering with the signal again? We can't stop him, but we can fight him, can't we? I mean, is there a way to construct a really powerful transmitter that can break through his blocking? Joe cradled his chin with his hand in thought and said, There is a way, maybe, but it'll mean traveling and scavenging a lot of equipment. I've got to ruminate over it. They all knew without speaking that their primary mission was still to make contact with Radio Ukraine and the other survivors. It was paramount. Brady didn't tell them about his contact with his mother. That knowledge was his alone. He didn't explain to them that since speaking with her, even for a moment, he felt even more in tune with things. The knowledge of her death broke his heart, but somehow, knowing that his mother still existed and was waiting for him somewhere, calmed his mind. She had given him direction, a reason to go on, a purpose. He needed to make contact above all. He didn't want to share her visitation with them for another reason. They had both lost loved ones, too. It would be cruel, he thought, to mention his own relief when they had no way of gaining it for themselves. They were sitting in near total darkness now, a single candle permeating the dark. Their faces were waxing moons in the darkness, half lit, half shadow. I don't believe in demons, said Kaylee. Do you believe in evil? asked Joe paternally. I guess, she answered. Joe replied, Well, if you can, then, think of Grendel as a personification of evil. I've seen many bad people doing a lot of mean things in my day. I've been a soldier, and I've seen man's blind indifference to his fellow man again and again. God's noblest creature is capable of almost any despicable act. After what's happened to the world, you have to believe that evil is real. Well, think of Grendel as a living thing, a walking manifestation of evil itself. And if he's alive, he could be hurt. Yes, but the question is how? I don't know, said Joe, but I know that there are two languages that everything understands, fear and pain. He uses both, so he understands both. Brady stood up. He fears us. He fears the people who survived. Apparently, we weren't supposed to do that, but we did. Why would he fear survivors? Because we didn't die? The virus didn't kill us? responded Kaylee. Precisely, answered Joe. We're immune to it. Somehow, divided and separated, we're easy targets. We're weak. But if we stay together, we present a more difficult conquest. That's it, said Brady in amazement. We all have to gather together. I mean, every one of us has to meet. Joe looked up and asked, Are either of you students of Greek mythology? Brady nodded eagerly. It was one of his passions. Kaylee knew enough to win at Jeopardy, but she'd filed Greek mythology into a cardboard box and shoved it under the eaves of her mind way, way back. Then you know all about Pandora's box. Yes, said Brady, beginning to understand Joe's reference already. Zeus wanted to punish mankind after Prometheus stole fire from Olympus. So he ordered Hephaestus to create woman, Joe explained. Nice. Women is punishment. That's fair, protested Kaylee. Right. Not fair, but a common conception in the West, Joe added. Anyway, Pandora was made the first woman. To her, the gods all gave something wonderful, unique. But they also contributed something to balance their gifts. They gave her beauty, but also jealousy. They gave wisdom to her, but also recklessness. I mean, she was perfect. When all the gods had given their gifts to her, Zeus gave his last. He gave her a jar, not a box, as most people think, and she was told never to open it. Let me, Brady said, wanting to finish the story. So Pandora was given to Epimetheus the Titan as a wife, and Epimetheus, whose name means afterthought, was told by his brother Prometheus, whose name means forethought, never to trust Zeus. But like he always did, Epimetheus didn't listen. 
He told his new wife simply not to open the jar and forgot about the whole thing. Joe was letting Brady continue the tale while he hobbled over to the bookshelf on the far wall, flashlight in hand, in search of a particular volume. But what happens, he asked Kaylee, whenever you tell someone not to do something? She considered it and said casually, they do it. Of course, it's classic. Right. One day when Epimetheus wasn't around, so the story goes, she crept into the closet and took the jar out and opened it. I remember, said Kaylee. She let out all the evils into the world. It's the same old story, like Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's just another way of keeping women in their place by blaming them for all the evils of the world. Maybe, Joe said, walking back to his office chair with a small volume entitled Encyclopedia of Mythology in his hands, but accepted as the gospel truth for thousands of years. Now, I'm not saying that any of this is true, but bear with me. It may help us to imagine it as truth to complete the metaphor. He sat down and flipped through the pages until he found K and then Keres. He began to read the text. The death spirits of the ancient Greek world, children of night, siblings of fate, doom, death, and sleep, hateful of humankind. In Latin, they were known as tenebrae, or the darknesses. Well, what do they have to do with Grendel? asked Kaylee. It's in here, Joe said, finding the page he was looking for and handing the tome to Kaylee. Read this aloud, he asked. She took the book in her hands while Brady moved next to her and focused a beam of his flashlight on the pages. She began. Nyx, the primeval knight, gave birth to Moro, Thanatos, Hypnos, and the tribe of Vioneroi. These we know as doom, violent death, and death. And then, though she lay with no one, she bore Momos, Oasis, and the Hesperides. She then bore the Fates and the Keres, whom we know as the Death Fates. Then she bore Nemesis to afflict mankind, and Apate, or deceit, hateful old age, that the Greeks called Geras, and then hard-hearted heiress, known as Strife. These are the ancient enemies of humanity, according to the Greeks. These are what was put into Pandora's jar. When she opened it, she let them out. Were they alive? asked Kaylee, knowing that the question was metaphorical. The Greeks thought as much. We replaced these myths with science, examining nature and methodically categorizing them, but Essentially, it's the same. I mean, think about the Keres. The Greeks were intuitive, weren't they? To think that illnesses and diseases were actually caused by unseen invisible creatures, germs. We call them bacteria and viruses. They called them Keres. Human existence is plagued with them. Brady broke in. What did they look like? How did they act? Kaylee read a little more, following the text with her finger as she searched. It says here that they were fanged, grim-eyed, bloody, had large claws that they used to catch men as they fell in battle to take their souls to Hades. They drank the blood of human hearts, and then, like empty cups, would throw the empty hearts behind them and run back into the battle until their thirst was quenched. Sheesh, I could have done without that last bit, Brady said. The original vampires, Joe added. Kaylee continued. These creatures were often more than the cause of diseases. They were the disease itself, a different caress for each sickness. They were cruel and relentless, and since they were spirits, they went where they wanted, when they wanted, especially into the bodies of their victims. They brought death wherever they went. Stuff of nightmares. And so we found ways to fight them with medicine, cleanliness, and knowledge, Joe observed. Sounds like Grendel to me, added Brady, Mean son of a gun, that one. Big and ugly, full of spit and vinegar. Well, how did they fight these things in Greece? I mean, if we postulate that we're dealing with such a thing, which I can't believe we are, then we might as well go all the way and figure out how they fought back, said Kaylee. Well, I imagine they prayed and sacrificed animals, answered Joe. I can't believe we're even considering this, Kaylee said. It all seems so ignorant. It's a theory, at least, interjected Joe a theory that we can work with. If he's the manifestation of all these evils, then he can be destroyed by antibodies, Kaylee asked. The virus kills so many people because there weren't any antibodies, said Joe, stating the obvious. 
Well, maybe, Brady said, just maybe we're his antibodies. We're nature's immune response to Grendel and what he represents. From the microscopic to the macroscopic, huh? He's the disease and we're the antibodies, Kaylee mused. They sat in silence for a moment, considering his words. Joe, in particular, seemed to be deep in thought. And then he said, I see. Perhaps that's why we survive, to make the right decisions, to stand when everyone else has fallen. But how are we supposed to destroy this thing? Antibodies in our bloodstreams have their own intelligence, in a way. They keep attacking until they destroy the virus. Chemical signals must tell them what is the foreign invader. Yes, and sometimes they attack so much that they destroy the host. I bet that's what happened with the virus that caused the pandemic. Immune systems kicked into overdrive. People were killed mostly because their own bodies, in effect, murdered them. That's what Dr. Grindle told us in the hospital before he changed into a murdering you-know-what, Kaylee explained. This virus was so successful at killing us, but after there were no people left to infect, it had nowhere to go. It killed its hosts, which is a stupid thing for a virus to do, Joe continued, and then wondered aloud, I don't get it. With the entire world at his feet, Grendel chooses to spend all of his time trying to kill us? If we were his antibodies, his natural enemies, then it does begin to make sense. I mean, where the hell did he come from? I don't understand that either. I was there in the hospital before Dr. Grindle went insane. Actually, he was a good guy, one of the best. But then he changed, suddenly, near the end of things. Maybe that's when he turned into the monster that Brady sees, Kaylee said. I'm telling you, he's not Dr. Grindle. He's what Joe said, a personification of evil in the world. It's, it's like this, Brady explained calmly and carefully. There was evil in people spread out through them a little bit in everyone, just like there was good in everyone, too. When all the people died, the evil needed some place to go. It gathered itself together and formed into Grendel. They didn't speak for a long moment while considering the idea. Nature abhors a vacuum. Heck, anything's possible, mused Joe. Now someone tell me how to kill it. Strictly speaking, it's not alive. It's only alive when it's in contact with its host. It needs a host to live. I mean, remember, every virus, or in this case, every evil, needs a host, Kaylee explained. Man, you must have got straight A's in biology class, observed Brady. Well, duh, she replied. We can kill Dr. Grindle. That will deprive it of its host, Joe said, a plan already developing in his mind. No. Brady shouted, I'm not killing Dr. Grindle. He's in there, somewhere. He's not so different from us. And there aren't many of us left. We need to get him out. Yes, of course you're right, interjected Joe. Dr. Grindle has to be saved somehow. So how do you kill the parasite without killing its host, asked Kaylee. She picked up the book and continued following the line of text for some time before she broke the silence. We'd better hurry if we're going to figure out how to save Dr. Grindle. It says here that the person whose body the wicked carers possess should beware because they would create envy, hatred, and jealousy to rule their hearts, eat away their body, and waste away their soul. You know, Brady said with a hopeful smile forming on his face, the myth of Pandora's box does say that she didn't let everything out of the box. There was one thing left inside, something... Really important. What's that? asked Kaylee. Joe interjected the answer. Hope. In the bottom of the box was hope. And as long as there's hope, we keep fighting. Grendel awoke to terrible pain in his mind and body. The act of exciting electrons in the upper atmosphere had been akin to having his body plugged into a transformer for a prolonged time. Cell damage had occurred, but he had been able to reverse it while he slept. There had been an unexpected problem. The host had begun to rebel, to fight back. It had been a feeble attempt, but it was a new thing to consider. In a weakened state, the host might even be able to put up a reasonable resistance to his presence. This wasn't something he needed, not now. 
He had already found himself drawn to the photograph of the woman and child. He had even spoken to them, seeking their forgiveness. Foolish, weak human emotions. He could do without those. All of nature could do without those. So many species destroyed, so many landscapes flattened, so much pollution and desecration caused by human emotion. In the new world order, without human intervention, nature on earth would continue on the path that had started upon millions of years before humans ever existed. It had been delicious. He ate the nightmares like candy. He burned the spirits of ancient hatred like so much gasoline in a tank. Gone from the world forever were Ephiales, Lamia, Stigere, and Aklis, as well as a hundred other lesser ills and spirits. Their energies, converted and governed by his internal engine, was transformed into the spectral pulses that covered the heavens, disrupting the signal of the humans. Mass and energy could not be lost or gained, merely changed and transferred. There was a downside. No more could he rely on their aid, for he had betrayed them to further his own plans. The multitude of enemies that remained within him whispered quietly among themselves of the betrayal, but then they remembered that they were still alive, still vital, even though they were now part of the greater being and had lost their own free will in the process. Some wondered why they had agreed to submit to this bargain with Grendel and longed to be among those of their kind who chose to take their chances in the free world now that humankind had been nearly erased from creation. Given time, they wondered in their black hearts, might not humans rise again? Was the hag right about this? Might not they survive to haunt the dreams of millions yet to be born? In the distance, just beyond his reach, Grendel could hear the hag cursing him. There was much ground to cover, and he needed rest. But he could not pretend that he didn't see the truth of the boy's observation last night. He was bonded to a human, tied irrevocably to one. Even if he could track the others all down and kill them, there would always be one more human. Him. End of chapter.